uh, be joining us when watching online. And I want to encourage those folks that are participating that we're going to be sharing in communion a little later in our service tonight, so you may want to have some things ready for that. As we come to worship this evening, this is a Monday, Thursday service. I realize this is a departure from the last two of these services that we've had, that we're all here instead of all being stuck in our own homes. We are all not having to wear masks anymore, which is fantastic. And uh, we're also not worshiping this evening together with the folks at Dedridge. We will be on Easter Sunday. So just a wee reminder to you that we have our service tomorrow night, Good Friday, here at 7 and then on Sunday morning, uh, on Resurrection Sunday, at 11 o'clock through at Dedridge Church. There will be um, links to get online for those services, and I'll make sure that you have them as soon as I have them. As we begin our time together this evening, we're going to be uh, spending just a short time tonight reflecting on uh, gathering together around the table, what it is to eat and to drink together, what Monday, Thursday really is all about as the disciples and Jesus um, gather for their last uh, proper meal together before Jesus goes to the cross. And as we begin our time this evening, we hear these words in the Psalms. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. And it is the works of the Lord's hands that we're gathered to celebrate this evening, even though that work, as we look towards Good Friday, is truly terrible. It is the Son of God being sent to his death unjustly for the sake of sinners like us. And yet we celebrate for all that that act was terrible in that it liberated us and frees us from slavery to sin and death. And so it's right that we sing God's praises for that amazing and most difficult of acts. So let's pray together and pray for one another as we begin our time of worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this whole week as we look towards Easter. Lord God, we do confess that We don't tend to celebrate in seasons anymore in the church. We, Lord, tend to focus on one or or two days. And yet, Lord, it's good for us to take several days at a time and separate them out from the rest of the week, from the rest of the month, the rest of the year, and give ourselves over to worship and to focusing on something truly foundational to who we are. So, Lord, we thank you that we can take time this evening Lord, on this Thursday night, and time tomorrow on Friday to focus ourselves upon what we are in light of Jesus coming and living and dying for our sake. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless us richly in these services, and we ask that your hand would be upon us. Lord, that we would praise your name, but we would know, Lord, more keenly perhaps than at other times, just how big a sacrifice this was. Lord, how deep and how dark our sin was, and yet how wonderful and glorious our liberation is in light of Jesus. Lord, we ask you would impress this upon us deeply, for this is who we confess we are every day. Lord, sinners saved by grace. So, Lord God, we pray that your hand would be upon us this evening. Bless us all in our gathering, whether here in the building or at home online. And Lord, we ask that you would draw us all together into your presence and enable us to know you and then to worship you. And Lord, we ask it all in our Savior's wonderful and mighty name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as per the psalm, we are going to gather not in the morning but in the evening uh, to sing praises to God for his faithfulness. We don't have a lute or a harp available, or even a lyre, um, but we're going to make do with a piano and a guitar and drums and voices. And so we're going to have to sing out because there's not as many of us as there might usually be. So sing with enthusiastic and loud voices as the band come and lead us in our opening song, Here I Am to Worship. Let's stand together.
been slightly on edge that I'm forgetting to put something on and take something off there. It's a lovely t thing to be able to sing without something over your face. That's the first chance I've had to uh, be able to do that. And it's, it's lovely to have that sense of normality and, uh, and be able to sing out and not feel that you're going to inhale in most of a face mask. As we come to um, Scripture this evening, I, we have two readings that we're going to um, read and then briefly reflect on a little later in our service. And the first is from Exodus chapter 12. And in Exodus chapter 12, uh, verses 1 to 13, we read these words. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts, the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you. Then I will strike the land of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord, and we give thanks to him for our reading of it this evening. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your words. And Lord, as we read it, we read of these familiar words, this familiar event in Jewish history, in our history. Lord God, we ask that you would bless us. Lord, that you would help us to see it afresh. Lord, you would help us to consider deeply what it means for a people and their sins to be passed over in the midst of a sinful people who will not have their sins passed over. Lord God, help us to understand what it means for a righteous judge to judge the sinful and condemn them. And Lord, help us to understand what it means to have a gracious Savior who reaches out to those who do not deserve it and lift them up from death and give them life. Lord God, we hear this passage, these words, this language so often and so, Lord, we ask that you would bless us tonight in our considering of it afresh, especially as we prepare to gather around the table later in our service. And, Lord God, we ask that you would give it special poignancy for us this evening as we consider the world at large around us who isn't gathering to worship this week. Lord, who don't know you, who are living in darkness, who are worshiping as the Egyptians did other gods, whether it be themselves or the gods of this age, Lord, the, the culture, the media, the politicians, the celebrities, whatever it might be. Lord God, we ask that you would give us wisdom as we look at ourselves and look at this world. Lord, that you would give us a deep and abiding compassion for our fellow men and women. Lord, a, a burning desire to see their salvation. But Lord, a conviction also that sin must be dealt with, must be judged must be condemned. Lord God, we ask all this in order that your will might be done here in this place and that your kingdom might come, a kingdom of light in the midst of darkness, a place of life, 
and of joy and of worship and of pleasure. And Lord, we ask all this in order that we might be able to prepare properly for our celebration on Easter Sunday. And Lord, we ask now as one family that you would come among us and bless us by your Spirit and by your Word. And we ask it all, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again, and then we'll turn again to Scripture, to a more familiar passage perhaps in Matthew's Gospel as we consider uh, Jesus and his disciples gathering to eat and drink as we will eat and drink a little later. So we're going to come, stand again, and have our band lead us as we focus on Jesus, all for Jesus this evening. second reading comes from Matthew chapter 26, reading from verse 17 to 29. And there we read, Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. 
And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This again is the word of the Lord, and we give thanks to him for it this evening. Let's pray together as we come now to God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for these two passages in your word. Lord, we ask that you would bless us with understanding, that you would raise our hearts and minds, Lord, not above the cares and concerns of our lives, but Lord, in the midst of it all, that you would lift our eyes to focus upon you. Lord, that you would help us to read and to know that whatever we are facing at the moment, however good or however challenging times may be, you still are present with us. You are still speaking to us, and you are still shaping us into the people you would have us be. So, Lord God, we thank you for this time, and we ask your blessing upon us. Lord, may we meet you truly in your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight on Monday, Thursday, we typically, I say we, it is the tradition of the church broadly to focus on a couple of different things. They focus on the disciples gathering together to eat this last meal as a sort of family preparing to celebrate the Passover and usually the washing of the disciples' feet um, by Jesus. All of this story is really by way of preparation for what's to come, and that's ultimately what I really feel Holy Week is all about. It is a week of preparing ourselves to celebrate together on Easter Sunday just how amazing the resurrection is. We can't understand how amazing the resurrection is without all of these other elements of the Easter story. It's strange to say that Jesus is raised from the dead if we haven't considered the fact that he has died. We can't understand why he's died until we go a little further back and look at some of these interactions he's got with his disciples. And so tonight, as we begin this process of preparation of being made ready to worship God on Easter Sunday, we consider this passage together, these two passages side by side. Preparation is important. And it's right that we do this. I remember a number of years ago, I was um, scheduled for surgery. And the night before, uh, I was due to go in for surgery on the morning following. A nurse came with uh, a doctor, and they talked through what the surgery was going to involve. And then they said, we've just, uh, we've just got one last thing to do. Can I just see your right leg, please? That's a slightly strange request. That's fine, but I let them see my right leg. And they drew a huge, big black arrow with permanent marker pen on my right leg. And I said, what, what's the reason for that? Oh, just to make sure that we operate on the right side. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, I'm simultaneously disturbed, but also very glad that you've gone to that level of preparation just to make sure that you don't get it wrong on the actual day. And the same is true for us at Easter time. It's right that as we prepare for Easter that we are ready to celebrate together, that we consider what the disciples are celebrating on this night, what Jesus is doing when he eats and when he drinks with them, because he's preparing them all for what's to come. And the question for us, I think, in this little passage in Matthew's gospel is to ask this question, are our hearts ready I mean, we come to worship every week on Sundays. We turn up to church. We're largely on time for that. We sit down. We sing together. We pray. We read Scripture. We do all these things. How hard is it to prepare for worship? 
Well, if worship is simply turning up and sitting down and then standing and sitting and standing and sitting and saying the right words and listening and then exchanging pleasantries and going home, then not much needs to be done by way of preparation. However, there is much preparation, I think, that is needed if we are coming together as one church family into the presence of a living God who has made all things and who has saved us despite our complete lack of desire for salvation, for a complete lack of desire for any kind of meaningful relationship with Him, and drawing us into His family, and then asking us to sing His praises, asking us to hear His voice. That, I think, does require something more. And as the disciples are preparing for that first Easter, Jesus is preparing each one of them. We know that uh, Judas has uh, already um, been sort of making his preparations to betray Jesus to the chief priests and the scribes. They've already hatched their plan. Judas has come along. The work has already been done, and they're wanting to kill him um, on the run-up to Passover. They really would like him dead just as soon as they possibly can, but they need it to be done in a way that's not going to incite a riot, and so already preparation has begun for the sacrifice of Jesus. Judas comes, he offers money um, to the, the uh, he, he's offered money by the chief priests uh, and so on, and so the stage is set. Jesus enters into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday that we, um, that we had last week, and again, preparation is made for what is to come. He knows what he's doing, but nobody else does. They think he's this great and glorious king come to save the people, and he is, but just not in the way that they think, and preparation has already begun. And then as they come to this upper room, Jesus again begins to prepare his disciples. He begins to speak about how his body will be broken, broken apart, consumed in a certain sense, about how his blood will be shed, that he is referencing them back to Exodus and what they already know, they're celebrating the shedding of blood, the breaking of this little innocent lamb's body for the sake of someone else, not it. Jesus is making preparations so that when the moment comes, they'll understand. They'll see things in the right way. They'll know how to respond. And the heartening thing for us is despite all his preparation, the disciples still really struggle. They find it so hard because Jesus is preparing them for something they think they know. But when it comes, they find it's something else. When we don't prepare ourselves to worship God and know the God that we worship, we're preparing for something that we think we know, but we don't really. It's essential that we get it right. It's essential that we understand correctly what Jesus is doing here and what that means for us. So, how are we made ready? How are we prepared for Easter by considering all of these things? Well, as you may know, I am a chaplain at the football club here in Livingston. And the interesting thing that you get to see when you go behind the scenes of a football club is all of the work that goes on from Monday, well, from the Sunday, really, right through to the Saturday morning so that the team is ready to go out onto the pitch and play at their absolute peak on Saturday afternoon. And it's unbelievable the amount of work that has to go in from the administrative level right the way through to the top tier of management and the board of the club all pulling together. It is a spectacular amount of preparation simply so that 11 people can walk out onto a, a, a grassy field and kick around a football for a little bit over an hour and a half. You wouldn't think that that much needs to go into that kind of thing, but every player needs to um, be ready. They need to have eaten the right things, got the right amount of sleep, spent the right amount of time in the gym with the physio, with other coaches to prepare them mentally for what's going to unfold over those 90 minutes. The excitement, the disappointment, the frustration, the elation, controlling themselves in every moment of the game, it's unbelievable. 
And as we come uh, towards the celebration of the Passover with the disciples, Jesus is doing all of this. He's preparing his disciples physically. He's preparing them psychologically. He's preparing them spiritually. And he does so by referencing back to this episode in Exodus, which defines them as a people, that moment where, as God so often says in the Old Testament, he leads them by the hand out of Egypt. He leads them by the hand out of Egypt by leading them through death, death for sin. Because sin always results in death. And it doesn't matter if it's God's people or any other people. Sin always results in death. And so he gathers them together and he prepares to eat the Passover with them. He gets them into that frame of mind where they understand how grave their circumstance is before a holy God. As the reminder of the salvation from Egypt goes in Exodus, it's not this glorious and triumphant note that you are so much better than the Egyptians. There is no hint of the, the people of Israel in Egypt doing everything that's required of them. And so God just carries them through. The angel of death is coming, and the people of Israel must do what is required in order that the grace of God might be poured out upon their lives. Why must the grace of God be given to them? Because they're a sinful people, just like the Egyptians. They struggle and they fail. And as Jesus chooses this moment in history to go to the cross, when he could have chosen any time, at any point, the chief priest would have had him killed months, possibly even years before this moment. And yet he chooses this moment. He does so to ensure his people have two things on their mind, sin and salvation. It's not popular for us to consider how sinful we are as a people in our society anymore. It's maybe never been all that popular, I don't know. But it's certainly not popular today. Today we're supposed to think about how great we are and about how empowered we should be, and how wonderful uh, my life is just because it exists. And it's true, it is wonderful. Life is wonderful. And yet, we cannot come to Easter, and come to Easter properly, without considering how deplorable our sin is, how dire our circumstances are, and not rush too quickly through to the other side of that. Jesus is reminding his disciples the only reason they're there is because God is a gracious God who takes sinful people like them and gives them what they don't deserve. A terrible sign is going to be enacted in Egypt. Death is going to reign everywhere. It's not just the people, it's everywhere. It is man, it is the beasts of the field, and interestingly, it is the gods of Egypt all will experience death as a reminder that they are not enough, that their lives are corrupted, that they are broken and damaged. And as Jesus chooses this moment, he doesn't just choose it to outline how awful the disciples are, even though from this moment on they're going to fail him more spectacularly than they have done in the preceding three years that they've journeyed together. They will all deny him, all leave him, all abandon him, so he will stand alone come the end when he needs his family around them. He also reminds them that there is salvation at hand. They come together and they're celebrating the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's this time when yeast is removed from cooking. In Scripture, again and again, that image of yeast is used all over the place. It's used to symbolize, most often, corruption and sin, the world, as opposed to the people of God. And how important it is to keep yeast out of the people of God, because just a tiny amount works through the whole batch of dough and influences the entire thing. Israel is to shun that, is to keep it out, keep it away so that they will be remaining pure, that they will be kept pure. Jesus is rewriting the Passover feast when he comes to it with the breaking and eating of this unleavened bread and the pouring out and the drinking of wine, which is familiar to them and familiar to us now as the celebration of communion. By reminding them that 
through no work of their own, they are made a pure people. They are made holy and righteous. They are separated out from sin by this great, amazing, gracious, and glorious God. And as we prepare to celebrate at Easter time, we must hold these two things together. That Jesus comes to remind us of how broken we were, but how pure we have now become. This isn't simply an opinion. This isn't based on emotion or how we feel. We don't need to ask the bread whether it feels leavened or not. We can simply tell. If there is leaven in the bread, it will work itself out as it rises and grows and um, is then baked. It's very clear the difference between bread with yeast and bread without. And so it is for us. This is a matter of fact that as we come to celebrate Easter together, we come with a terrible um, backdrop of sin and yet a glorious realization of the reality of our salvation because of what Jesus has done in the past. This is how we are prepared to celebrate with these two things together, the sorrow and the joy. And what happens when we do this, when we're made ready to celebrate? Well, when Jesus comes to celebrate this feast with his disciples, um, they eat, and he tells them that one of their number is going to betray him, and the disciples are stricken with grief, which I find fascinating. There's none of the bravado that they've had before, that surely they'll all be great and stick with him, and, and they won't desert him. They all are sort of panicked. They're spooked a little bit. They're frightened. It's going to be them. And when Judas finally asks, Jesus tells him, it's you, and none of the other disciples really pick up on this. But Jesus goes out, and we're told um, in John's gospel that it is night. Jesus says that one would betray him, and that one would be better for him if he hadn't been born. And when he tells his followers that the betrayer is going to answer for his crime on the last day, uh, when it comes in God's judgment, again, he is preparing them for the celebration of the resurrection. As we get ready for Easter, as we are prepared to remember our sin but also celebrate our salvation, we are being prepared to see the world in the right way. That there is darkness and despair, and it's easy to see that today. We turn on the news and we see it all over the place. We have politicians who are being um, charged for committing crimes that they've instructed all of us uh, not to, to go and do, that they have put laws in place to uh, stop us from doing it. We have wars, and we still have famines in Afghanistan. We have dire circumstances all over the world. Sin is breaking and corrupting everything, and yet, because God is a God of salvation and justice, we're being made ready for the celebration at Easter to confess that justice will be done. This, this betrayer will answer for his crimes. No stone will be left unturned. No sin will be left unpaid for. And that is a great and a wonderful thing, something to be celebrated and to give us hope. Because we wonder what justice will Vladimir Putin or any other world leader ever have to give Boris Johnson, Nicola Sturgeon, what answer will they ever give for the things that they do when they seem to just skate through all of these problems that are caused? They never seem to be called to justice, and yet we are assured they will receive justice for what they've done, one way or the other. Jesus will pay it all, or they will. And so as we are prepared to celebrate Easter, as the disciples are prepared, we're being made ready in body and in mind and in spirit to worship together. We're being given both the despair of the circumstances of our world and the joy of the circumstances of the kingdom of God so that we will see this world and our lives aright. How does a young child wait for mom or dad to come home from work? 
Usually, unless they've been bad and they've been told, wait till your dad comes home or whatever it might be, usually it's with a note of excitement or joy. They typically can't wait to see you. They want to show you what they've been coloring in today, the things that they've done. They want to tell you the places they've been. It comes out in a rush of words where they're stumbling over themselves to get out everything they have done in one breath rather than wait and tell you one piece at a time. They want to be picked up. They want your attention to be lavished upon them, and so it is with those who are prepared for Easter. Our lives are changed as we live with Him each and every day. And so we live with the wonderful, glorious expectation of the coming of our brother, our Savior, our Master, knowing that when we finally enter into His presence, we will live in His joy forever but we can only know that joy if we've been properly prepared. We might want to get to the glory of the resurrection, but to get there, we have to begin with the awfulness of sin, the betrayal of God by His own people, the death of Jesus on the cross, and then we can come to the glorious note of resurrection. So as we prepare to come around the table this evening, Let's do so holding these two things together. We were lost and without hope, but thanks be to God. We have a Savior who is able, who is worthy to be our Redeemer, who comes not just to be served, but to serve each one of us tonight. Let's pray together as we prepare to come around the table. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for these evenings together. Lord, we are a people who are marked by the resurrection, and we confess that with great joy every Sunday. And yet, Lord, to know what it is to be raised from death to life, we must also confess that we were once dead. Lord God, we must confess the darkness and the depravity of our sin, and Lord, none of us wants that. None of us wants those awful parts of our character, our history, dragged out into the open. And yet, Lord, we must, in order to know who we are and where we've come from and where we are one day going. Lord, we ask this year, as we get to celebrate Easter properly together as a church family, that you would indeed truly prepare us. Heavenly Father, we ask this because as we gather on Easter Sunday with our brothers and sisters in Dedridge, we want to pour ourselves out completely in praise and in thanksgiving. And so, Lord God, we give ourselves over to you and ask in the remainder of this time that you would hold together before our eyes, Lord, that fate from which we have been saved and that future to which we are being saved. And Lord God, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to come together and gather around the table to remember the death and the resurrection of Jesus in these elements. I conducted a wedding just on Saturday past, and it was a great reminder to me of how rich the Christian tradition is in um, acts of worship, not just in the words that we say and in the words that we sing, but in the things that we do. We have a man and a woman stand at the front of a whole room full of people separated out from their families, confessing their love but their commitment to one another. They give and they receive rings, uh, one between the other. They sign a, a, a contract with one another, and all of this is done in the presence of witnesses. The whole marriage ceremony is a physical enacting of what the marriage relationship is supposed to be, this confession with everything we are that we are committing one to the other. And the same is true as we gather around the table. This is a physical act of worship. It's not simply eating bread and a cup. We don't believe there is something sort of special that happens to the bread or to the juice in the cup as we eat and we drink it together. It remains bread and juice. And yet in this physical act, we are reminded, we are confessing to each other, reminding one another that we're worshiping God because of what He has done for us, the lifting up from death to life that He has done on our behalf. 
And we hear these words in Mark's gospel, similar to the ones that we've read in Matthew. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Everything that we've been talking about in those few verses. He is reminding them of the death that they had to die, that he had to die on their behalf, the breaking of his body, what was just to come, but also the whole renewal of not just their lives, but of all creation as he eats and drinks with them together new in the kingdom of God. As a new age dawns, a new reality begins because of what will unfold in the hours following on from this supper, this Passover meal that they eat and they drink together. As we come together around the table, as we prepare to eat and drink, we're going to pray for one another, and we're going to pray for the wider, uh, the wider world. We're going to pray for Ukraine as they uh, celebrate, as we're doing tonight, in various churches across their country. But we're also going to pray uh, for people who are affected here. Uh, I had a conversation with a chap today at the fridge uh, who's Polish and is being called back to Poland uh, to serve as part of um, the Polish Armed Forces training of not just Polish men and women in the army, but also Ukrainian men and women in the army who are being trained in Poland and then being sent back over. And it's been a while since he's been in the army, and he didn't expect to get that phone call, but he has to go. And it's affecting the lives of people in our country in all sorts of ways that we might not be aware of because we're not connected in that way. Uh, that they are. So we're going to pray for our wider world as we prepare to eat and drink together. So let's pray for our church and for our world. Sovereign Lord, we come before you this evening. And Lord, tonight, as we remember the disciples gathering to celebrate something they thought they knew in the Passover, Lord God, we thank you that we can celebrate with them. Lord, we're eating and drinking now 2,000 years on. We know what they were truly celebrating that first communion night. And yet, Lord, we confess that all too often we eat and we drink, Lord, unthinking, not reflecting on what is truly going on. And so, Lord, tonight we ask that you would prepare our hearts and our minds to eat as one family, as people who are joined with a bond that goes far deeper than flesh and blood. We are joined together by the broken body and the shed blood of the Son of God. And so, Lord, we ask that you would bless us in our eating and in our drinking. Lord, we pray for one another, both the people gathered here in the building in Cedar Bank and at home. Lord, we call to mind the names and the faces of our dear brothers and sisters in this fellowship of the children that worship with us week by week. And Lord, we lift each one before you. We ask that you would bless them in their needs and in their plenty. Lord, we ask that you would give them the strength they need to see through this day and into tomorrow. Lord, we have many who are sick and who are struggling, and we ask that you would bind them up. Lord, we have many who are brokenhearted for all sorts of reasons, and we pray, Lord, that you would make your presence known to them as the one who will never leave them, forsake them, betray them, or disappoint them. Lord God, we pray for those in our fellowship who are struggling with old age. Lord, that feeling that time is slipping by and they don't know how they've got there. That concern they have for what the future will hold for their physical health and their mental well-being. Lord God, we pray for the youngest in our fellowship who... Lord, don't know what tomorrow will bring and have their whole lives before them, and Lord, have many concerns. Lord, are frightened for an unknown future, who hear of wars and rumors of wars, who see death and famine and plagues all over this world. Lord God, we ask that you would strengthen them and equip them to remain faithful to you and help us to train them up in the way they should go, that they won't depart from it when they're older. 
Lord God, we pray for our younger adults who are preparing themselves for life in the workplace and are going through university or college or already through and are beginning on careers and, Lord, in marriage and in relationships with one another. Lord, we ask that you would be with them and guide their steps. Help them to understand what is important, what should be sacrificed for, and what shouldn't be. Lord God, we pray for our whole fellowship altogether. Lord, we ask that older men and women who are wiser in the faith would teach the younger ones. That the younger ones, Lord, would lend their strength and enthusiasm to those older ones. And in every way, Lord, the body of Christ might be built up. Heavenly Father, we love one another in this fellowship because you have set your love upon us. So help us to eat and drink together because we love one another and we love Christ. Lord God, we pray for our community that doesn't know this love, that doesn't understand this experience. And Lord, we ask that you would bless them by our presence in their midst. Lord, may your spirit and your word be carried to them. May they be confronted with their sin, gently perhaps, but confronted nonetheless and then presented with a great and glorious Savior who can, uh, Lord, can lift them up, can raise them from death to life. Lord God, we pray for our wider world. We pray for political leaders, Lord, and for the influence they have. And we pray, Lord, for countries all over this world, especially countries like Ukraine, like Russia, like Afghanistan. Lord, we ask that you would come in power among those people, Lord, that you would present yourself as both a great and terrible judge, but also a wonderful, gentle, and caring Savior. Lord God, may the people of this world know that sin will be answered for, but also that sin can be atoned for. And so, Lord God, we lift the people of Ukraine before you. We lift our brothers and sisters in that land before you who are celebrating as we are doing in the preparation for Easter. We ask, Lord, that you would strengthen their voices as they sing, that you would, Lord, draw their hearts closer to you as they pray, Lord, that you would strengthen their hands and their feet as they serve. For, Lord, Ukraine needs them to be strong. Their land and their people need them to serve and to care, to bless, and to share the good news of the gospel. So, Lord God, use them, we pray. Heavenly Father, we pray as well for the nations around them, some of whom have people living in our country, here in our town. Lord, we pray for all those people who are caught up in the midst of this and are simply despairing because what on earth can be done? How can this ever be fixed? Lord, I've heard those words today already. And Lord, the only answer we have is the glorious hope of the gospel that we have a mighty judge and a mighty savior. So Lord God, we pray for all those who are broken and hurting in this country and in Ukraine, and in Russia, and in Belarus, and in Romania, and Moldova, and all the other surrounding countries, in Poland, Lord. We pray that you would bless them and encourage them this Easter time. And Lord God, we pray for our leaders here. They're not perfect, Lord. They never claim to be perfect. And yet, Lord, we see the evidence of it in the news all the time. And so we pray, Lord, that they would have true humility and not just a desire to say the words that they are not perfect. Heavenly Father, this Easter, we ask that you would prepare them to lead truly as godly men and women. And so, Lord God, we ask that the gospel might break into their lives, Lord, that they might be truly saved. And Father, that they might seek to use the power you have given them for righteousness' sake and not simply for the sake of having it. Heavenly Father, we ask all this knowing that as we gather around the table, we are gathering to together to confess the greatest power in all the universe. Lord, the power that can change dead people to living ones. And Lord, if you're able to do that, you're able to hear our prayers this evening and answer them fully. So Lord, we come before you and we ask that you would hear our prayers and respond in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to celebrate as we have been doing over the last uh, number of weeks and months as we come out to the table, uh, row at a time, and take bread and take the cup and go back to our seats, and then we'll all eat and drink uh, together. 
On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant.